Our guest in this segment is a former congressional representative out of the 15th District in Pennsylvania, Congressman Charlie Dent. He joins us via telephone. Congressman, good morning to you. Hey, great to be with you, gentlemen. Great to have, for having me. Great to have you with us as well. Mr. Stubblefield, you have a story to tell leading to this introduction. Well, yes, I, uh, uh, I've heard of or been aware of Congressman Dent for several years. Uh, he was uh, he's kind of that what is now a rarity in Congress. Uh, he was the common a few years ago where people worked across the aisle. They they called their the other party friends. They got together and they had a beer or they resolved problems. But it's all done in a collegial manner. Uh, and uh, uh, Congressman Dent was kind of the leader in, uh, in, in this group. We don't have that anymore. Uh, the other day, uh, a group from uh, George Washington University uh, held a uh, webinar and Congressman Dent was one of the presenters. And uh, as part of our, our, our Republican legacy, uh, which uh, Congressman Dent's involved with, but it laid out in the clearest terms that I've, that I've seen yet uh, the differences in the Republican Party and the, uh, the evolution in the last uh, 20, 25 years. We've all made the comment that the Republican Party is not the Republican Party we knew a few years or so ago, but we've never quantified that. We never put matri uh, matrices on it uh, to really understand what it was. Congressman didn't, didn't did this, so I was quite impressed with the webinar, and uh, uh, we approached him and asked if he would come on the show which he agreed to do. So welcome, Congressman. I'm so glad that you joined us today. Well, thank you, Bill. It's really great to be with you. And I look forward to this conversation about our Republican legacy and you know the state of affairs in the United States right now, and the, and the GOP in particular. And subsequently, since the invitation, yeah. we've had the presidential debates. And then recently, you had an op-ed published uh, through MSNBC.com, which called for President Biden to step aside and surrender that nomination on the Democratic side. So this is an interesting discussion over the next half hours. It will cover two sides of this coin here. And let's uh, first, if you could, give me uh, your impressions from the debate that took place this past Thursday, uh, Congressman Dent. Yeah, you know, I've been saying for many, many months that uh, the choice in this election is that you know, the American public, a large swath of the electorate, uh, thinks that one of these candidates is too old, Joe Biden, and the other a bit too dangerous and crazy, and that's Donald Trump. That's been the view of a lot of the, of the electorate. And, and I think that the debate validated that concern, especially as it relates to Biden's age. I mean, he was just, uh, he seemed addled. He was, he seemed feeb uh, you know, pretty feeble up there. You know, he just was uh, just really way off. And uh, it just verified what many people had been saying. And, uh, and I, I get the sense that uh, if, you know, if you're trying to make an argument that, you know, the democracy is in peril and that your rights are at risk, you know, maybe you want to put somebody up there who can make the argument. Uh, that, that wasn't Joe Biden. And, you know, this is Kamala Harris made a comment after the debate, something to the effect that, you know, it's not about the last 90 minutes, but about the last three and a half years. You know, respectfully, this really isn't about the last three and a half years. It's about the next four years. And I think many people who watch that debate, including me, don't think that Joe Biden couldn't complete a four-year term, or at least not uh, one where he would be uh, fully in control. So I, I think he needs to step aside. And if the Democrats were smart, they'd, they'd replace him. Uh, I was also one of the guys, I, I'm, I'm good friends with your your buddy Joe Manchin, uh, Senator Joe Manchin, and I, I kind of thought that you know low, no labels is on the right track trying to put together a fusion ticket. Uh, and they got and for that effort, that, that organization was berated, uh, you know, threatened, uh, told that they were, you know, going to elect Donald Trump, and now here we are. I mean, it would have been refreshing to have some type of a more centrist candidate up on that stage next to the other two, one to, you know, to contrast with Joe Biden, who's clearly not altogether there, and uh, Donald Trump, you know, who can give you an avalanche of prevarications uh, throughout his presentation. So, but that's where we are, and uh, like I said, if the Democrats want to win, they're probably going to need a, a better standard bearer. But you used an operative word a while ago, uh, Congressman, and uh, the president step aside. Uh, I think if we, if there is a substitute, an alternate uh, to Joe Biden, it's because he does step aside. There's no mechanism in place now that the primaries are over uh, to uh, put uh, to substitute him unless he steps aside. Is that correct? That's my understanding yeah. that he has to. He would have to step aside, and then they could uh, transfer his delegates. 
uh, to somebody else. And, you know, obviously that would be messy for them, but, uh, but it can be done, <laughs> and there's still time to do it. I'm sure they'd rather not do it, uh, but, uh, you know, we saw what we saw. I mean, it's hard to unsee or unhear what we witnessed. And I used an analogy in my op-ed. I said, you know, gosh, you know, I remember in the, in the, uh, when my mom was in her 80s uh, when I was in Congress, she got in a car accident. Luckily, I happened to be home that day. I was called to the scene. It was right near my mother's home. No one was injured, but she lost control of the car. She took out a lamppost. She took out a, she took out some shrubs and a mailbox and then a tree, and uh, no, nobody was hurt. And I, I got to the scene. I talked to the police officer. You have to insist that she get a driver's test. And my mom said, "Oh no, I just need to get a new car. It's all good." And I told my mom, "You know, you're a, you're a menace to the motoring public. You shouldn't drive." And, uh, and you know, and she never drove again. You know, because my brother and sister and I, that's what families do. You take the, the keys away. And in Joe Biden's case, I'm not saying he can't drive. I'm just saying maybe he shouldn't have the keys at a nuclear post. Um, and and uh, I just that's why I just I felt very strongly about it when I watched that. And I, I supported Joe Biden when he ran in 2020. I'm not saying this you know, out of any malice. I just I just think I saw what most Americans saw, 50 million plus and many millions more will be watching the, you know, the, the worst highlights and the and the analysis, which is obviously not very good. So so that's kind of where I come down on this thing. But they can replace him. Uh, like I said, it's not easy. Frankly, I, I said if either either if either if party substituted out their, uh, their nominee, say you put Nikki Haley up against uh, Joe Biden, I suspect she'd mop the floor with him. I think she'd beat him resoundingly. And uh, saying, well, the other thing, I don't know if the opposite would be true, but I suspect if they put in a Josh Shapiro or a Whitmer or or uh, or uh, West Moore, that the Democrats have a better chance of winning the White House than they do now uh, with Joe Biden. Before this debate, I thought Biden you know, maybe had, maybe had a slight advantage in this election still, but after that debate, it's kind of hard to imagine how he, he he's going to pull it off. What's going to be the tipping point? Uh, the uh, we hear only what we're we're provided. Uh, that said that the Congress the uh, uh, the legislative leaders in the Democratic Party are all rallying behind President Biden. The family obviously is rallying behind President Biden. Uh, that They say the polls make a difference, but there's such a small uh, majority of the folks, small number that have not made up their mind. The polls that, that the majority have made up their mind uh, that the polls will shift very, very little uh, one way or the other. Uh, so that leaves the donors. Do you anticipate the donors to become a very active mover if there should be a move to replace, to substitute or have the president step down? Yeah, I'm sure it's the donors who will, who, who will push this <laughs> hardest at the end of the day. But you're right. Look, most people are in the tank for one candidate or the other. Uh, they're totally in. Uh, but, you know, there's, a, there's still a swath of the electorate out there that maybe is not as politically engaged as most. And, uh, you know, it might be, I think, probably more, they're concerned about issues, more concerned about their own lives and, you know, the cost of housing and food and things that affect them immediately. And, and again, I, I, I think that's that small swath of voters who's not, you know, watching Fox or MSNBC every day uh, is, you know, maybe if they see part of that debate, you know, they're, they're probably, <laughs> it's just not going to give them any confidence to vote for Biden, is what I'm saying. And that's why I, I think they have to, the Democrats are right. Yeah, you know, this, the, you know, he might still be able to win. But I think it's a lot harder now. I mean, it's a risk for them uh, because, you know, Trump, you know, he whatever, you know, whatever you want to say about Trump, you know, he at least looked like he was he was on his game. Granted, he said a lot of things that weren't true, but uh, but he he at least looked like, you know, he was in control of himself, which was a, <laughs> which was kind of remarkable, given how he can debate sometimes as he did with Chris Wallace a few years ago yeah. in that debate. Where the he's, the he's muted mics control, helped, yeah. But, you know, he, yeah. Congressman, this is John Gilstrap. Uh, are we even having yeah. the right discussion here? I mean, we're talking about this as if it's a sporting event. Who's going to win and lose in November? We're talking about the, yeah. the free world here and what happens at 2 o'clock this afternoon. Uh, what, what I saw uh, at, during the debate was, was frightening, like a national security issue, an imminent national security issue. Shouldn't we be talking about that as well? Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, the reaction from world leaders was not good. I mean, I, I think it's, it's fair to say that many allies of our country, you know, are very fearful of a Trump presidency because he doesn't particularly respect allies. He's, he, he regularly talks about withdrawing from NATO. He's, he's ready to surrender Ukraine to Russia, to, to Putin. Uh, yeah, there's that. And then they also saw Joe Biden. Many of those leaders, I think, do respect Joe Biden. 
Uh, but I think they were also a bit mortified about what they saw and we saw, that, that he just didn't seem to be in command um, and that he was a bit addled and, and, and seemed and so so feeble and weak. And that's and I think that's a that's a problem. I mean, with the presentation to the world, you're right, uh, was not good. You're right. We do talk about this too often in terms of a horse race. Um, but the stakes are enormous. I mean, it's, it's really about the, I think, I think people are looking at it and saying, is America ever going to pass the torch of leadership on to the next generation and on either party? You know, we have two guys, one at 81 and one at 78. Um, both have been around now for a long time, particularly Biden, but the Trump has been around now. It's his third presidential election he's run for. Uh, and I think a lot of people are saying, doesn't America have a new generation of leadership that can help, you know, that, that can, you know, face these and confront these challenges? Uh, internationally, you know, from the Indo-Pacific uh, to Europe and, of course, the Middle East. Uh, this is a dangerous place for it right now. And I, you're right to talk about it that way, and you're correct that we too often talk about it in the horse race terms. Congressman Charlie Dent, our guest here on the program, former uh, member of the House of uh, of the uh, Republican Party in the House of Representatives. Go ahead, Bill. Yeah, I was going to, say, I was going to lead in the next section. Uh, Congressman Dent spent 15 years uh, as a member of Congress, had a chance to see a very up close and personal. Uh, and you've made the, uh, uh, the observation, uh, Congressman, there has been significant change uh, in the Republican Party in the last few years. Uh, would you address uh, some of the observations you made and uh, some of your thinking behind the change? Uh, yeah, I noticed it particularly since the Tea Party era that we started to elect some folks um, it, it, during the Tea Party era, and then it, it really accelerated in, in the era of Trump, that we saw some people coming in who were, you know, they struck me as performative. Uh, they struck me, some of them, as um, – you know, not not really understanding what their role was in Congress. That they, they, you know, they seem to think that the, some of them came there really with the idea to blow it all up. Okay, but it, you know, but we, but when you had a divided government as we did then, and we do now, now this back in, when I say then, back in 2011, and now again today, where you have a divided government where you know one party controls the House and the other, uh, the other two chambers, um, you, know, you 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 understand that. You know, compromise is not a dirty word. I mean, you need to get to consensus on some issues. You have to do the basics. And that means in the House, you know, Republicans are going to have to vote for bills that are going to be voted for by Democrats in the Senate and signed by a president, in this case, named Biden. And that's just the harsh reality. And it's it's not – and for many, it was kind of stunning. They, they, they kind of thought that we were a unicameral system, some of my own party, that, you know, let's just get a bill passed out of the House. And we've done our job. Well, no, you really haven't done your job. And you know, I used to always kind of say we have to kind of look around the corners a little bit. So if we pass a bill out of the House, we send it to the Senate, we have to kind of anticipate what the Senate might be able to do, what their limits are. Uh, and, and then you know, we're going to have to vote for whatever the inevitable compromise is if we, if we want to get this thing across the finish line. And some just can't accept that. And this is what caused Kevin McCarthy to be ejected, uh, what caused uh, Mike Johnson, Speaker Mike Johnson, all kinds of Term, you know, headache and turmoil uh, over the last uh, several months, uh, and and again, there's it's because of a group of people who just simply don't, uh, uh, you know, don't uh, really believe in governance, so to speak. I mean, I think it's a dirty word. I mean, you know, you're you're running for office and you get elected, you know, you have to govern, particularly if you have a majority in the House of Representatives, particularly if you control the White House too. Uh, and so, but when you have this divided government, you know, people are going to have to figure out ways to work together to get to a solution. It's not always pretty. It's not always easy, but it has to be done. Otherwise, you'll have uh, utter dysfunction. And, and look what's happened now. I mean, in the House, I've witnessed, uh, what, I think seven times uh, Republicans, House Republicans couldn't pass a rule. That is, you know, that just means when you're in the majority, you pass the rule. The rule basically sets the parameters of what you're going to debate on, you know, the bill. And if you can't pass a rule, you can't run the place. And if you're in charge, that's a really bad look. And, and that's happened multiple times. Uh, and so that's one of the reasons why I've gotten involved with this Our Republican Legacy Project. And we want to try to get the party back to some core principles and, and focusing on things that are enduring and sustainable and not just talk about this, uh, you know, this, this populist movement that doesn't really seem to be grounded in anything other than you know, uh, loyalty to one person. 
You mentioned divided government. Uh, much of our history has worked with divided government, and for much of the time, it's worked very well. I remember uh, a comment by Steve Roberts, Koki Roberts' husband, uh, must have been 30, 40 years ago, and he gave statistics how a lot was done, a lot more was done under the time of tenured divided government. But that's not the case anymore. We do not get anything done uh, with divided government. And how are we going to get around yeah, yeah, that? You know, I always felt the same way, too, as uh, Mr. Roberts did, that uh, you know, divided government gives each side an opportunity um, that y- you can vote for certain things that, you know, each side. It's, it's hard to kind of it's hard to blame the other side for the law being terrible if, if a lot of your guys voted for it, too. And so you can share the credit and you can share the blame. Uh, that's the beauty of divided government. And uh, if, if when, when it, what happens, though, when uh, we, what we've seen in recent years, when each, when each party has control, they try to jam as much through as they can on what's called reconciliation on a partisan basis. And, uh, and those reforms tend to be less sustainable and less enduring as opposed to a, a bipartisan um, – as opposed to a bipartisan reform. They, they tend to be much more sustainable over the long term. You know, just like how we fought over Obamacare or the Trump tax cuts or whatever – um, you know, it's because they were done on a partisan basis, we you know we're just not as enduring um, policies, and, uh, and it really further divides us as a country. Has this particular two-party structure run its course, Congressman Dent? You know, I, I don't know. What's, what's changed is that the, I think the two-party system has served the country well. Uh, the problem, of course, is uh, at one time our parties tended to be much broader coalitions that weren't particularly coherent, to be honest with you. Uh, you know, <laughs> for you know, in the old Democratic Party, you had um, anti-union, some segregationist, but we old Democrats down south. You had northern liberal unionists up north. You had a, it was a, a hodgepodge. It didn't make a whole lot of sense. Uh, and uh, Republicans, you could say something similar. We had northeastern, midwestern, more, more liberal, moderate people and other very conservative. But the beauty of that system was that neither side, each side knew that they couldn't they couldn't pass a, a, a very harsh partisan agenda because they couldn't get consensus within their own groups. That's why they needed a bipartisan. Uh, that's why they needed to do things in a bipartisan manner. It, it forced a certain amount of centering that there was a bit of ideological diversity within each within each party. Was that which actually was healthy? Now we have a much more ideological conformity, and 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 I think that has not been good for the country. Uh, and uh, you know we've. The parties have sorted themselves. It feels like we're operating in a parliamentary system, even though we're not one. And we have these parliamentary voting uh, wave cycles now. Uh, and you know, or I, used to, I used to always say candidates mattered. Uh, I, I think now that candidates matter a little less. They still matter, <laughs> but not as much because uh, you know. Look at your own state, Joe Manchin. You know, he wins. You have two very fine senators there, and Joe Manchin, and Shelley, Shelley Moore Capito, and. Uh, but you know Joe Manchin, you know he was he was winning the state in 2018 while Donald Trump was also winning by by 40 points or whatever it was, and and he was and he won re-election to the Senate. I did the same thing in 2008, my third election, I guess, for Congress, and you know Obama won my district by 13, and I won by 18 that year. But you don't see that happen much, that type of ticket splitting, uh, because people have kind of sorted themselves now, and they, they tend to pretty much vote with their team. Uh, and even if they like you, if you're not on the team, you know, it's hard to get their votes now. And I think that's a – this is a big problem for the – it's a big problem for the country. Yeah, I think under the, your Republican legacy, you mentioned five tenets, unity, rule yep. of law, physical responsibility, market economy. And the one that intrigues me is peace through strength. Would you speak to that, please? Yeah, I mean, I, maybe I'm a little bit more traditional. You know, my dad was my dad was one of eight kids. You know, five boys, three girls, and my dad graduated high school to, when the war ended in, in '45. But you know, all the rest of them served. And my mom was in the State Department after World War II. And I, I kind of, I, I always believed in this post-war order. You know, Pax Americana. And I think a lot of us in our group, our Republican legacy, do think that we should. Uh, you know, embrace our allies, that we do think that they are a force multiplier, that we can advance American national interests uh, through, uh, you know, through our alliances and trade agreements and so forth, that they're mutually reinforcing, that we should push back against uh, tyrannical autocrats that are trying to disrupt the international order that we, the United States, helped build and have led all these years, and it's worth supporting and not blowing it up. 
uh, and that American leadership is essential. And that means that we do need a, a strong defense. At the same time, we need to be very smart diplomatically and, uh, and also in the in development assistance space, too. Uh, so my my bottom line is that we believe that um, you know peace through strength is is you know, we we shouldn't behave in these isolationist protectionist manners or even these unilateralist uh, manners. We you know we we should uh, lead and we should push back and we know what our values are and uh, and we shouldn't apologize for it. And, and we, if we stick together with our friends and allies, you know nobody's going to stop us, China or Russia, anybody else. We're going to be able to uh, really determine the course of events. I think. Um, over time. You know, this is John again. When you try to trace down when in, in the halls of Congress, when the belligerent times started, I guess it depends on whose ox is being gored. When, when were the Obamacare years, the Affordable Care Act, 2010-ish, I want to say? Uh, well, yeah, yeah, 09 or 10. Okay. Yeah, oh, yeah, so 2009, 2010. I think it became law in 2010. So, Where yeah. you got you to right. pass it in order to know what's in it, that, that sort of thing. And I, I think yeah, Americans... Exactly. Republicans certainly felt bullied through all of that. And since then, there's, I have felt that there's been this, this backlash and this sense of revenge. Whoever has the, whoever's responsible for the chamber has to get even with the other side. And there seems to be this cycle of, of vengefulness that goes back and forth that, that, that's unbreakable. And most recently with the, um, with the impeachment hearings, whether they were valid or not, notwithstanding. Is there a way to break that cycle? How, how, do, you, how do you get people to just stop being so angry and then start governing again? And you have one minute to answer that. Yeah, yeah how, how, do you get, how, do you get, how do you do this? Well, pe- people have to be just willing to talk to each other. They have to be willing to accept that their their political adversary is not evil or, or an enemy but just you know you just think maybe they'll be a little bit misguided but you're going to have to work with them and recognize that there are opportunities where there's probably more areas of agreement and disagreement on a lot of issues but a lot of folks don't come into this uh into it this way uh, they come in there thinking the other side is this inherently evil and how can you negotiate with a, 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 another party if they if you think they're evil and they're no good I and mean, that's true on both sides they just don't uh, and I don't, I, we have to break that cycle by bringing in people. We need the center. We, frankly, I think we need a more centered government right now. Uh, the center is collapsing in Congress, and it's not just happening here. It's happening throughout much of the Western world. But we've got to, we've got to have to fight this and, uh, and bring it back to a more uh, stable governance than what we have, because right now we're not on a, on a good trajectory. Former Congressman Charlie Dent, thank you so much for your time this morning. Good stuff. Thank you, gentlemen. Great thank, to be with you. Thank you, Congressman. Right, take care.